uh, delighted to talk to you today over the next 15 minutes or so about the disruptive resilience agenda that we at HSG are championing. Um, in this session, myself and my colleague, colleague Alex Basena, uh, both of us work on urban resilience, will be speaking to a number of very exciting speakers who will introduce uh, as we go along. Uh, and discuss some key propositions on what needs to change when it comes to the current landscape of managing risk in cities. Uh, if I can get you to get a thumbs up from Camilla to confirm if you can see the screen and my presentation. Great, thanks a lot, Camilla. The idea here is really quite simple. The central one line selling proposition is that the nature of risk that cities in the global south are facing has changed dramatically. However, ways of managing this difficult have not kept the pace and we need to change that and we need to use new, innovative, and dare I say, disruptive approaches to deal with the disruptive risk that we now face in cities of the global south. So, what are these disruptive risks? There are at least three kinds of shifts in risk that are taking place. One is we are seeing more and more extreme and outlier events. And there are loads of examples of this. Uh, the archetypical one being that the infrastructure in New Orleans was geared to deal with a one in 50 year cyclone event, whereas Hurricane Katrina was a one in 400 year event. We are seeing more and more of these quote unquote black swan events happening more frequently. Uh, we are also seeing uh, this is taking place and unfolding over large areas. And this is again, uh, the lots of examples of this. Really great one, a really uh, illustrative one comes from uh, South Asia, where in 2020, when Cyclone Amphan was approaching the southern coast of Bangladesh and the eastern seaboard uh, of India, these areas were also suffering from the outbreak of COVID 19. And Odisha, which is our state in eastern India, has historically been beset by cyclone risk, has over the last 20 or 25 years. Built a really great factor called tackling systems. And at the, at the center of that, their cyclone dependent plan is the development and use of cyclone dependent shelters. But when cyclone Amphan was approaching, 25% of cyclone shelters were being used in COVID 19 isolation center. And the state was unable to deal with multiple concomitant risks that are taking place alongside. And this is by no way a one off. This is a trend that is happening more and more uh, through COVID 19. 51.2 million people uh, face storm floods, extreme heat events, and the onslaught of COVID 19. So, we are seeing that we have to gear ourselves up to deal with these multiple cascading risks at the same time. The last way in which the risk is changing in cities is through the growth of teleconnected and transboundary risk. This is where a disturbance in one part of the globe leads to a massive disaster in another part of the globe due to the increasing densification of global economic and social systems. A few years ago, uh, Cyclone Noc 10 hit the car production um, the areas of Thailand. Not only did it lead to uh, cataclysmic uh, failures of car manufacturing plants in Thailand, but it led to shutdowns of car manufacturing facilities all over Southeast Asia. South Asia and Latin America, which then had downstream economic impacts on the communities living in these areas. Uh, and there are other examples of this, including a grid failure in California that led to a collapse of basic services in Mexico. And I can go on and on. So, this is the landscape of risk that we're dealing with. This is the problem that we're dealing with. So, our proposal is that we need to change the way in which we are conceptualizing this existing. And chronistic ways of managing risk in cities are no longer valid and we need to change. And there are at least there are changes in at least five domains of action that we're proposing. Number one, uh, all good action begins on a strong foundation of data, and we need new ways of data. I'm going to go into detail in each of these five pillars on the next slide. We need to engage with the informal sector in a much more substantial and meaningful way than we have. We need to look at new and exciting and innovative and relevant ways of financing. We need to reconceptualize what we mean by resilience of urban systems. And we need to rethink the way in which innovation happens in cities for tackling risk. Here's a bit more detail. Now, in this final slide, or penultimate slide, rather, I'm going to describe 
So this business as usual, and what are the changes that we're proposing? And I'm going to try and convince you by giving empirical examples of how some of these changes are afoot, and we need to amplify, expand, and build on these early case studies of good practice. So let's start with a bit of data, and I'm going to go into more detail on the data which with one of our analysts afterwards. So when, when it comes to business as usual, data of course has a central place, but acquiring and analyzing data is a delicious in of risk management in cities. However, by and large, uh, data analysis and collection is highly centralized. Either we have uh, experts who model hazards and then that leads into decision making, or we have experts who fly into cities of the global south, do vulnerability assessment, uh, vulnerability assessments, extract the data, analyze it uh, in a Bangkok or a New York or New Delhi, uh, and then make decisions based on that. It's expensive, it's arduous, it cannot deal with the dynamic disruptive risks that cities of the global south are facing. And many times, the scales at which uh, this data is collected do not calibrate with the scales at which decisions need to be made. A uh, case in point is downscale modeling, even downscale kind of models are aligned with municipal decision making features. And so, we're proposing that we need to disrupt the way in which we are acquiring and analyzing data. And we need to do this through rethinking the highly centralized approaches that we've been using up to now. And we argue that we need to adopt decentralized and distributed approaches of acquiring and analyzing data for understanding risk. And this can be analog data. And Slum Dwellers International has led unique experiments in, um, sorry, unique uh, initiatives through which people living in informal settlements self survey themselves and make themselves seen and heard. It's embarrassing to talk about this with Diana and others listening in who uh, looked at a lot of this work. And of course, we have Beth from SDI as well listening in who will be able to shed more light on this. Or we can have digital data where there's a whole new range of digital uh, approaches to acquire and analyze data that draw on AI, that draw on machine learning, that draw on quote unquote big data approaches. Let me give you a quick example of one of these. So one of the biggest issues that many cities in the global south are going to face is extreme heat. However, uh, understanding the degree to which cities will be impacted by heat attacks uh, needs the acquisition of accurate air temperature data. And in cities, it is very difficult to acquire air temperature data because this varies block by block, street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood. It depends on how many trees are on the street, uh, what is the, uh, how much glass is used in building, et cetera. So this is a challenge that people have been grappling with. So to overcome this challenge, a really innovative startup in America has figured out that every Android phone in the world is constantly monitoring that its battery temperature. And through real-world calibration, they've developed an algorithm that converts battery temperature data into air temperature data. They simply they figured out that batteries at 10 degrees, the air is at 8 degrees by and large. Through this, they now have razor fine air temperature data from 500,000 um, cell phones or data points spread across America cities, which allow them not only to monitor air temperature, but over time model heat waves much more effectively. And this is just one of many examples of an expanding array of low cost, easy to use, uh, decentralized approaches to acquiring and analyzing data for decision making. Now, uh, and I just want to point out that this was a uh, uh, sort of argument that was a bit out there a few years ago, but through COVID-19, we've seen uh, even governments in the global south jumping on the big data bank either, through things like contact tracing, which has delivered impact at scale. Now, I want to underline that I feel like they, I'm not a big data evangelist, uh, and I feel like data is just one of five components of a systemic framework for tackling the disruptive risks that we've described. The second crucial part of that is engaging with informality. As a rule of thumb, 33% or so of all cities across the world are informal. In the global south, with Canada, this, is, this number is higher. And how the world briefly and thinly are sometimes simply and thinly impacted. So, informality is a, uh, is a huge issue that all of us, and that we just need to uh, deal with. Now, in existing urban resilience initiatives, of course, there's an engagement to the informal sector. However, my argument is that this has taken the form of participation of piecemeal engagement with the informal sector, where engagement with them can be used to validate decisions that have already been made. People in the informal sectors are at best seen as recipients and beneficiaries, at worst seen as a problem to be tackled. Therefore, we are arguing that we need to change 
and bring about a paradigm shift in the way we conceptualize engagement with the informal sector in the context of enhancing resilience. And this needs to be now be predicated on a model of partnership, not on participation. This is much more than a record. The key difference here is that we need to acknowledge that the informal sector can be a leader, we can demonstrate leadership in finding solutions, and external actors need to provide an enabling environment for this leadership to emerge. We need to make sure that decisions are made from the ground up and are calibrated with local context. And we need to acknowledge and understand that the informal sector is a crucial partner uh, in finding solutions. Again, this is much more than a regulated arm. We saw examples of this happening all over the world with COVID. And Smriti, who's from Bombay, can shed more light on this one in a minute. But in Mumbai, uh, Mumbai has Asia's largest slum, Dharani, and uh, historically, uh, residents of this neighborhood of the slums actually much more. It's also it was almost like a main city and had a fairly again, antagonistic relationship with the city government. Um, However, unique forms of meaningful partnership emerged between the city government and residents of Dharavi with the name COVID 19. Two examples of this are that Dharavi has a number of informal, semi trained medical practitioners that were shunned or ignored by the formal system. However, during COVID 19, the city government realized that the only way they were going to provide medical services uh, to this massive informal segment is by partnering with these informal actors, informal providers of medical systems. So they provided them training, they developed a network, and they gave them um, medicines and equipment to deal with the outbreak of COVID-19. Another example of this was in Harali was that the government realized to accurately map the extent of the COVID-19 infection in, the, uh, in this area. They had to partner with citizens, and therefore municipal corporation uh, employees and members of the settlement formed teams that went house to house to survey and map the outbreak of COVID-19. As to examples of how this partnership can actually come about, even in context that is set with great secure power dynamics. The third and important element of this is urban services improvements. Uh, we need to make sure the transport infrastructure um, uh, and health, all these critical systems and cities are resilient to uh, the multiple interaction shocks and stresses of the city in the global south phase. However, when it comes to business as usual, there has been an inordinate and overwhelming emphasis on um, strengthening uh, infrastructural aspects of the Don't take my word for it. 98.2% um, of all the money that went in from the global environment facility to cities went in for the delivery of heart systems. Um, and the remaining 2% has been given for developing capabilities and capacities when they could develop those capacities that would be useful for operating in our systems. Uh, there's a uh, decision making around systems driven by uh, standard operating protocols that don't accurately acknowledge the dynamic nature of this city. And therefore, we argue that we need to shift from this inordinate, disproportionate fo focus on the infrastructural aspects of city systems to much more of a focus of developing capacities and capabilities of people running these systems. We need to make sure that people running the system have the capacity to make decisions under uncertainty. And we need to make sure that uh, management approaches such as rapid adaptive management become real approaches that can be adopted by city managers. Uh, again, during COVID-19, we saw this happen serendipitous. All of us saw that the opening and closing of public transport, public spaces in big cities across the world matched the rise and fall of COVID infection rates, which is in effect, uh, emblematic of an adaptive management way of being. It's just that here it was being done reactively, and we are arguing that we need to destroy it. The penultimate component of our disruptive resilience framework is innovation. Given that we are facing uncertainty, given that we are facing uh, outlier and extreme events, we need to make sure that there is innovation capacity within these systems to deal with these extreme and unprecedented events that we haven't dealt with before. Of course, when it comes to business, there is some innovation. However, I would argue that this is centered, expert led, Eurocentric in its approach of delivering sort of the best possible solution as opposed to solutions that are calibrated to local cultural context and are good enough. And therefore, we argue that we need to create an enabling environment for frugal, endogenous, bottom up, uh, and iterative innovations to emerge from those on the ground. Um, and again, there are lots of examples uh, of this. I think uh, my colleague Eric Casper is probably listening in on, uh, uh, on 
on this uh, give, give an example I always give of uh, proven innovation to faculty on this. He worked in the state of Nahigar, which came to the deep waste and power cuts, and especially in low income areas of big city in Chhattisgarh. And therefore, he developed uh, a low cost backup generator made of small um, solar panels, second hand batteries um, of motorcycles. He rigged them up and created a backup generator and then linked it to a social enterprise where women in villages surrounding the big city of manufacturing these backup generators which allowed low-income households to have a fan and a bulb uh, when there were blackouts to tackle the pernicious impacts of increasing heat waves. There are a whole load of examples in this. In COVID-19, we saw a lot of quote-unquote Jagar innovation that Sonana and Smoky and others from South Asia would be well aware of to deal with the risks that we face. That has happened in an ad hoc, reactive manner. We need to create an ecosystem in which that will happen in a proactive manner. Finally, None of this is possible without the right kind of finance to tackle risk. And I will keep my, keep my mic up. Apologies to all those online that I keep saying in and out. Um, now, when it comes to finance, at the moment, anyone who's had the uh, experience of dealing with a big multilateral fund knows that by the time of any kind of an entity writes an application for finance to deal with the risk, it's five years, at least five years, in the first down of its own. These existing ways of flow and static, they come with low quantities of finance, high conditionality, uh, very high barriers to access that threaten and put to be in the global south are uh, unable to access. We need to transition to a new landscape of financing mechanism that can uh, tackle emergent dynamic risks uh, in the global south. These need to be endogenous, part of flexible, uh, and accessible by people. Uh, one of the things that keep banging on about um, is the uh, startling lack of um, understanding about municipal resilience bonds. Many cities in the global south, especially some of the risk left cities, do have the capable, administrative capability of issuing municipal bonds. Many municipal bonds have been issued to raise financing for greater resilience. We need to build an outlier example, such as that Cape Town, that issued a municipal bond to deal with the water crisis to expand this way of securing financing that is good. Uh, before I move on, I want to say that the Human Settlements Group is doing work across all these different uh, uh, verticals. I'll give a couple of quick examples. Uh, we, uh, Anna, who's just keeping your name, who's just nipped out, and I have been working on developing a platform for low cost endogenous innovation for climate and energy in Sub Saharan Africa, which will hopefully come to fruition soon. Uh, which will spot, scale, um, and strengthen existing innovations that are contributing to dealing with climate change. Uh, a lot of our work, especially some of our, the work that Fakar and others are leading on building urban labs, has this idea of uh, leadership from, uh, in, from the informal sector and low income communities building the heart of it. Uh, and yes, we have uh, an emerging piece of work and uh, agenda around municipal resilience bonds. We can all I just want to end by acknowledging the big debt that uh, we owe to ENU for informing some of these ideas. A lot of these come from really remarkable issues of the journal published in uh, you know, fairly consistent over the last 10 years. And um, some of the people uh, who, are, who inspired these arguments are listed here. Apologies to those who are missing. There's always a great deal of missing people. Uh, and of course, many of those uh, we are very grateful are listening in today and all are in the room. Uh, so thank you for that. However, if there was one article that I would it would be the editorial that both the David's uh, David Satterway and Dave Dodd wrote for the 2013 issue on resilience and transformation that really is the foundation in informing my thinking uh, on these issues. If any of you uh, want more information, uh, apologies for the cheap plug. Um, these are the two publications that um, you can look into. So uh, thank you very much. We're going to transition to the more interesting part of this um, session and invite uh, Smriti to go off mute and put on her camera. Aditya, did you could you please repeat your question because the mic is not very clear. Sorry. Sorry, Smriti, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, it's slightly better. Okay, let me just do this properly once before it being a problem. Let me just see this mic is is this mic any better? Yes, yes, it is. Uh Smriti, 
you're a, a planner with Spark. You have a lot of experience of working with the informal sector on issues um, of sustainable development and resilience. Just want to give you a space to react to some of the things that you heard uh, in, in a minute. Tell me what you think you got right, what you think you got wrong. Um, Aditya, I think what we've learned through the Federation's network and SDI and across uh, grassroots organizations is that uh, data, as you rightly mentioned, is rarely available at a disaggregated uh, level. And it's very important to acknowledge both in the development and development with a climate lens on it, uh, as we are talking about this today, that uh, it's, it's important to have data that is collected, owned, and it speaks to the needs of the urban poor and the data that which is inclusive and decentralized, which is available to the communities as information to drive local action. And we've seen this more so in, in informal settlements that have looked at master plans, like in case of Kenya and Mukuru and in Dharavi more recently, where we did interventions during COVID, that without having uh, that sort of data, which can be used as information uh, by communities to drive local action, um, communities otherwise just remain beneficiaries of the process. And it's important for them to become partners and, and source of solutions. And that is something that we've seen uh, again and again. And it's, it's now more so relevant because when we're talking about driving action in climate change, uh, this kind of data, both in terms of numbers and also spatially is to be available both at the board level with the mm -hmm. governments at the local level and at the communities is, is very central. You, I think that's a good point. Can I ask you to just describe for us because I know you've been doing a lot of this and now you're putting a lot of that into practice with your remarkable new initiative roof over our heads. Tell us a little oh. bit of how you're changing these dynamics um, around participation and leadership in the formal sector. Uh, in Roof Over Our Heads, especially through the development of your urban labs? Yeah, uh, Roof Over Our Heads, we like to call it Roof for short, is a part of the Race to Resilience uh, campaign that was launched at the COP27. Uh, it's conceived out of the Poor People's Ask within the SDI Federation's network of women, uh, and it emerges out of a recognition of collective failure uh, to address lack of access to safe and decent houses uh, for most vulnerable communities um, to transform housing to ones that can survive extreme weather conditions uh, through locally driven solutions. Um, it's taken in the form of what we call as rural learning labs, where we are learning and producing with the urban poor. Um, labs, uh, ten, 10 labs in India uh, that we've begun with, which aims to test a framework uh, that can then be scaled up to 100 labs globally. Uh, the labs are central to the reality that 93% of poor people self-built and self-finance houses incrementally. Uh, poor people build out of necessity and choices they make that are intuitive through trade-offs um, and, and coping mechanisms that emerges out of basic survival. Uh, what we want to do in these labs is uh, put uh, people's needs at the center and to invite peer-to-peer -peer learning across cities uh, to say, where, let's retrofit where necessary and rebuild uh, where possible. And it sits at the juncture of uh, looking at challenges that emerges from microclimates and uh, what are the responses that micro markets have been able to do so far. And as Tom mentioned in the beginning, that 96% um, of the construction materials and techniques haven't really ch uh, changed since time. Uh, these labs seek to create alternatives in design, construction techniques, materials, and finance, uh, that which is affordable, accessible, available, acceptable, and adaptable uh, to the open. Great. Okay, thank you so much. Um, one final question. So um, you find yourself in an elevator with uh, a mayor of the city that is um, highly at risk. Well, maybe not the Indian city where mayors don't have much power, but just go with my uh, go with my question. Um, in about 45 seconds, what would be three things that you would suggest they do for reducing the risk in the city? 
Uh, could you repeat the last sentence that they're sorry? Anything that you would recommend to a mayor in a city of the global south that is familiar with on reducing risk? I think in order to reduce risk, there are no straightforward questions or answers, but uh, I think it's important to have uh, data uh, that talks to the needs of people. Two, it is important to look at local solutions that emerge from communities that come up with local scientific knowledge. And three, uh, it requires uh, a range of actors uh, like academicians, the knowledge networks, professionals, innovators, and industries to come and work uh, with the communities to co-produce. Wonderful, Thank you so much for being on the Thank you for joining us. I hope you stay with us. Thanks, Aditya. I'd now like to invite Dr. Sanjay Gupta, Vice President of Global South Asia Research Institute, to give us a brief introduction on the Global South Asia Research Institute. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. 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 Thank you very much, Aditya. That was a, an enlightening presentation, as always. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Smana, for being here. Um, I have a couple of questions, um, and I want you to basically help us to understand from your uh, practice perspective how, how can we actually do uh, basically the perspective that Aditya has given us on data. So we know that the, the ability of data to influence decision making. Uh, depends very much on the relationship of trust between those that produce the data and those that consume it. Right? We also know that everyday interaction between groups uh, can actually um, uh, produce the trust between these two groups. Right? So in other words, we know that trust and data production are somehow in their world. They can produce each other. So I wonder, from your perspective, uh, how do you think we can use basically um, address uh, uh, the issue of lack of trust between governments and marginalized communities and cities. Um, uh, how can we address this issue through the opportunities that new technologies on data relation can offer? Thank you, Alex, and thank you, Olivia, for framing the discussion the way you did. I do very much like the framing of five dimensions. Um, of disruptive resilience. Um, I think on the data part, and um, for this, I'm going to draw um, from my experience of working in East Africa primarily under the uh, program the Raja, uh, just to contextualize it, uh, what I'm going to be sharing later on. Um, I work primarily in the communication system field, where I work with um, communities in informal settlements predominantly to improve their capacity um, of uh, capacity to take anticipatory action uh, by using the weather and climate information such as forecasts and early warnings. So that's one part of it. And on the other hand, um, I also work with uh, National Meteorological Services of the countries that I work in um, to develop their capacity to engage with various stakeholders, including informal sector communities to provide better weather and climate information um, through products and services. Um, so in order to do this, we have worked very closely with these two uh, groups, um, but also several intermediaries in a city. So that would involve um, NGOs, very much like Spark and several who are on the ground with us today. Um, and say media organizations, so that's the community radios, citywide radios, and other media houses. Um, also, city governments at different levels. So, for example, municipalities are quite like municipal governments are quite important in this process. Um, so, now when we went into the region to do this project, obviously, the first thing we found was there was a significant lack of trust. Um, between informal settlement communities um, and the government. Uh, that is largely because they feel, I mean, they are a marginalized uh, community and they feel um, 
often excluded from basic services that the more affluent parts of the cities um, have better access to. So understandably, there is a lack of trust. So that was one of the first things that we had to sort of address. How do we bring all of these different actors to the table um, who, who don't really trust each other um, and, and then work together to improve um, the way the city handles uh, the communication of early mornings and um, action in severe weather. Um, as a millennial, I would say um, I'm very much uh, pro technology person, and um, technology does offer uh, the benefit of scale solutions of scale that probably you know other things, non technology solutions may not do as effectively. Um, however, at the same time, um, I would say that technology is only a part of the solution, but not the entire solution in and of itself. And I think that is something um, uh, we, we have tried to uh, embody as we've been approaching this. So we've taken um, a view of like using technology where it's appropriate, relevant, uh, and accessible, um, and combining that with human intervention and services, uh, co-production processes. So in terms of um, like a question around newer technology and how um, that uh, new technology and the intersection with uh, data collection, um, use of data and trust. Um, I think participatory data collection, something that um, I'm here you earlier, is we found it's one of the best ways of approaching this. And I know there are several examples um, from the Global South um, on how this uh, has been done. I've uh, also <laughs> alluded to one of the examples I was going to share. Um, I had come across this project in Kenya where um, uh, community members um, were reporting on some climate related data through SSD, the phone SSD mechanism. Um, and, you know, there are several ways of doing that. Some of the more um, the other ways of doing this is also using. There are lots of polling platforms that are uh, cost-effective that can be used. Um, there are there's also social media. I think um, social all of this comes with risks, um, and that is something that uh, we've been we've tried our best to be mindful of. Um, for example, if you're using technology that is um, on smartphone or smartphone related. That obviously raises the question of access. So, what is uh, what is the level? What are the varying levels of access um, communities in a geography have to smartphone? Number one, and number two, what is their access um, to mobile data or sort of internet? And we found that um, in in common settlements specifically, there's it's it's a shifting scenario, but there is a challenge in access to that particularly by data, which is considered to be quite expensive. So people don't seem to have it on for, um, don't seem to have it on for um, throughout the day, but rather switch it on at certain points to you know, seek certain uh, information. So that raises questions around, say, things like early warnings or you know, the, the uh, continuous access or continuous torsion of uh, data collection. Um, yes, so whereas in India, where I'm from, um, that landscape has shifted significantly. Um, there is high penetration of smartphone, uh, even, in, even in informal settlements, and uh, mobile data has gotten significantly cheaper, and therefore uh, there's more continuous access to it. So there are, the technology landscape is shifting, and that provides a lot of opportunities, but it's also important to think about the risks uh, when we choose these uh, options. Thank you very much. That was uh, an excellent um, sharing. We really appreciate it. So I'm, I'm going now to invite this to the perspective of um, a Professor Nightingale from the Department of Sociology and Human Geography of the University in Oslo. Her academic interest is from from political ecology, social nature, critical development study, uh, feminist theory, and methodological work on um, um, 
mixing methods across the social and natural sciences. Uh, she focused uh, very much around three themes like uh, climate change adaptation and transformation, public austerity and state formation, and emotions and subjectivity within environmental governance and policy. I think her perspective particularly bringing everyday practice into an effect to sociopolitical adaptation is very interesting and actually can help us understand uh, as well from where this disruption that comes from the social can actually emerge. Uh, Professor Nightingale, the floor is you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks for inviting me. I feel like I'm going to kind of zoom us back out again to more abstract questions, which um, I hope doesn't feel too awkward given the really kind of rich and grounded um, discussion we've just been having. Um, but I was asked to sort of talk about how a feminist approach to resilience um, and cities was useful in our analyses. And I guess for me, there's sort of um, kind of two or maybe three main points I wanna make. And I think one is that when we think about um, social inequalities, or I prefer to think of them as social differences, um, we tend to put them into categories and boxes. So we have informal settlements, we have women or gender, we have different racial groups or ethnic groups or caste groups. We think about class. Um, and I find those categories to be really helpful but I think where my approach to those categories maybe differs uh, by the kind of performative feminist theory I use is that I understand them as something that emerges from our everyday interactions and from the ways that we conceptualize and understand how power operates in society. So if I go back to Gotham's opening talk, he discussed the sort of the relation or the, you know, he distinguished between the normative, the analytical and the operational. And for me, I think if I start in the analytical domain and I say that it's not so much about, you know, how gender relations exclude women, but rather it's about how power operates through gender to shape who is imagined to have the right knowledge to deal with a challenging new future, to, to, to govern, you know, who is authorized to govern change. And that authorization is coming through the way that we imagine um, inequalities to operate in society or um, yeah, how we imagine them. So um, just to give you a, a more tangible example, Within the adaptation and resilience um, kind of work, there's often a focus on um, kind of who is at risk. So who is it that needs support for adaptation and resilience? Um, and those people are almost always imagined as different from those who have the capacity and the knowledge for creating change, for building um, adaptive capacity, if you will, or building resilience. And I think that distinction is, I, I like the framing that um, Aditya put out at the beginning, because that's precisely challenging that kind of framing and saying that we have to get away from believing that the people who we consider to be the most vulnerable are not useful in terms of having knowledge, having agency, having um, resources and practices that are useful for us going for or useful going forward in terms of building resilience. Um, and so from a kind of more analytical point of view, if I think of how, how power operates to create social difference, rather than just assuming that that social difference um, already exists, but rather I need to see how um, the shape of our cities, so the kind of um, spatial arrangements of housing and access to services, 
serves to kind of create and reinforce and, you know, kind of, um, if you will, like a ring fence, various kinds of exclusions. Uh, I'm sure I don't need to say that to this audience, but my point is an analytical one, which rather than sort of taking those as given, I understand the way that the structure of the city is complicit in um, both is created by and complicit in the ways that power is going to operate to uh, differentiate society in the present and in the future with really significant consequences for these core questions I have, which are, you know, who is authorized to govern change? Who's imagined to have the right knowledge to cope with mm -hmm. a uncertain future? Mm -hmm. Who's imagined to need support and who has capacity? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex and Savannah. I think we have uh, five, six minutes, seven minutes for a couple of burning questions, but uh, we might request uh, gentlemen to help us with the mic situation. Do we need to pause or are you happy to? Thank you. Uh, I'll go to the room first. Any questions? What? They can hear this. Yes. Uh, Alex, do you want to do a test on that mic to see if people on Zoom can hear us? Hello, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Anybody? Hello. Can you hear me clearly? If uh, if Adriana can give us a yeah. thumbs up. Not very clear. Those mics are not audible to people on Zoom. They can hear this mic very clearly. Yeah. Okay. But he's here to fix it for the rest of the day. So. Thank you for bearing with us. We just want to fix this mic issue so all of you online can hear us. Again, can you hear me clearly? Diana, did you hear? Yes, Adriana? Is it clear now? More or less. Okay, we're going to try and uh, power through. If the audio is really bad, please just put it in the chat box and we we'll request the gentleman to come and help us again once. Great. So, are there any, if I go to Zoom first, uh, take a couple of quick questions, anything from what you've heard from our different presenters or uh, on what I presented, any questions would be welcome. Please, what, uh, please tell us who you are and then please go ahead with your question. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Hamza Abdullah. I I'm a student of Master's of Science in Urbanization and Development at the New School of Economics. Uh, and I'm very happy uh, to be here and listen to all the experts and their insights. So, uh, uh, my question is related to uh, the discussion of informality and uh, poverty. I also come from Delhi. So, I, I see that uh, Delhi is an uh, unequal city and there's, there's a lot of uh, urban poor and a lot of uh, uh, scholarly work has also pointed this out. So uh, my question is that uh, in the backdrop of, of the current uh, political regime in India, uh, would the definitions of informality or poverty itself uh, be more problematized? And uh, uh, like uh, because uh, a lot of uh, uh, experts advocate for uh, retrofit, rebuilding, or uh, upgradation of the settlements of urban poor. But how will you deal with uh, uh, these questions in, in the way of to uh, demolish certain settlements within the urban core based on their identity of, uh, while sparing others? And uh, uh, if we talk about the data and uh, having the data of informal settlements or the informal people uh, in general, then uh, how do we protect certain people? 
who who engage in informal practices of street mining, how uh, uh, how do we protect them against the state and societal violence? If the state have has their data, then the vigilantes group have a chance to go there and commit acts of violence against them. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that uh, introduction, Lisa. Uh, I wonder if I can call on Smriti to respond to those. Smriti, I don't know if you got. Either of those two questions, but fundamentally, in my view, both of them deal with the ways of enhancing accountability um, um, in, in cities of the global south. Can I have any reflections? Yeah, hi, Aditya. I, I'm not sure if I could hear it clearly, but I think it's talking about accountability uh, for data. Um, I, I think uh, one of the things that I would like to ask is that why do we think that the state doesn't have data? The state has the data, it's at the aggregated level and much of that data doesn't serve the needs of the people. And when the data is there in the ownership of communities, they can choose to do what they want to do with it. They can leverage the data to negotiate um, and much so work with the governments to do something about their needs. So it's, it's not so much of a threat to, uh, the data is not so much of a threat as the way I think um, is being perceived at the moment. Thanks, thanks a lot, Smoky. Thanks, Hamza. Moment, do we have any questions online? In which case, I uh, just want to check if Christina is online. Uh, thumbs up from you. Hi, Aditya. Yeah, I'm online. Uh, both of you, for any reflections, you've been, you led the Urban Resilience Program for the Rockefeller Foundation, then worked a lot with governments on adaptation policy. Um, any reflections? What have you missed? What have you got right? What did you find interesting? Would be useful. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, the conversation this morning has been incredibly useful and incredibly interesting. I, I think, to me, the things that that are resonating the most, um, and and hopefully I'm audible. I've had a huge amount of computer issues, and I'm joining by audible. phone. Okay, sure. thanks, Aditya. I think the things that have been resonating with me have been the, the focus on the operational, actually. So often we, we think of that as not a realm of, of, of research um, uh, and, and, you know, in some ways almost uh, a little bit beneath the, the researcher's realm of, of expertise and, and preoccupation. And I, I think there's a, a real need to change that because there is so much that comes down to the operational details that needs to be understood, that needs to be investigated. Um, and, and I just see a lot of opportunity within the urban resilience space to get to that operationalization, um, to understand how to do it. Um, and as, as Tom said earlier, really share lessons across Northwest, South, East. <laughs> um, it, it, there's so much opportunity for that. Um, the second issue um, that really resonated is the innovation agenda. Um, and, and there is so much of that jagad innovation going on all over the world, um, across silos, across boundaries. There's finance innovations, there's technological innovation, there's process and policy innovation. And we shouldn't forget those. Um, and I think there's, there's great opportunity to nurture those innovations and again, help operationalize them and help them scale. Um, uh, around all of the urban resilience challenges that, that we face, whether it's the um, incredible work uh, that we heard about on early warning systems or um, the infrastructure, as I think Tom mentioned, the painting buildings white, there's cool and reflective paints and all sorts of innovation on urban cooling that um, is, is certainly needed and, and, and needs to be scaled. Um, and, and all of that is not to say that there isn't um, and a real need for that, that deep social reflection and understanding of who's excluded, who's, um, who's privileged, who's, you know, I think it, it, it who isn't. Um, and it, it really, to me, means a new way of doing business um, really aligned with that, that decolonization agenda. Um, and I see IID really on the front lines of, of doing that and has been for a very long time, maybe in different, different names, different paradigms. Um, but I think that's, that's a, a, a real important um, element for, for empowerment, but, but really just for success um, and for, for breaking through um, 
yeah, I'll I'll stop there. Just you know, one final question. Uh, is sure. That you're currently working with the UN Foundation as the lead Brazilian, effectively setting up the resilience program. Are you able yeah. to give us any uh, a sneak peek into how other areas might uh, figure out emerging plans? That's a that's a really good question. It's again a tough one institutionally because the the UN the multilateral system sort of ends at the national level, um, in in many ways. Of course, we have UN UN Habitat, um, but I think when it comes to resilience, I I'm constantly seeing the subnational, the locally led, being at the forefront. Um, and so I think there's there's great opportunity to sort of bring bring the UN agencies, bring the multilateral system to think much more about the urban and subnational governance in, in general. Um, uh, it's not easy to do, um, I will say, but, um, but I think it's ever so, so critical. So I think a uh, great opportunity for, for continued collaboration and discussion. Great, thank you very much, Christina. And I think with that, we are unfortunately all out of time. I'd like to thank all the speakers and panelists and respondents for their very enlightening comments.